Hey guys, it's Cass and welcome back to my channel. Today we are doing a book haul and I don't know if this is my second, my second, I think I'm posting for the year already, but I scrounged up a little bit of my personal money I always set aside and took a little extra here and a little extra there and then spent it all on books. I think I have like $3 left. So <laughs> I have to put myself on a budget because if I don't, I would just buy books all the time and I'm really trying to be good about getting through my TBRs before continuing to buy books to read them. But without further ado, um, I'm gonna put a timestamp down below for every book's title. I'm two years into taking reading seriously, so my description and stuff is very elementary, I feel like. I call things cool and exciting and interesting. My vocabulary is limited in that way, so that's just a disclaimer there. Let's just be real about who I am. I'm an avid book lover. Um, but definitely not from the educated sense. I don't have like a degree in, I don't have like a degree in education or my college degree is in art. So in graphic design with a minor in photography. So I am just a book reader, but that's just a disclaimer. First, I'm going to start with just some things that I picked up at a secondhand Bookstore, we took a bunch of books in, got store credit, and turned around and bought other things, which is one of my favorite things to do besides just donating. Um, and then moving forward, when we move and are traveling, um, I'm gonna be putting all my books into little libraries and kind of cycling them that way instead. Um, but I'm gonna start with those two. Then I went on, I took myself on a little Barnes and Noble date this morning. I've been having a really bad week. Um, and used it as an excuse to spend the rest of my personal money on taking myself out to get a green tea latte and some books. So we'll go over those. And at the very end, I believe it's 10 or 12 books that I got from thrift books. My thrift books, um, I guess you could consider it like an affiliate link, um, but it's just like a, my code, my link. <laughs> if you sign up, you get, I think, a free book and I get a free book which if you're new to thrift books, definitely check that out. Without further ado, let's jump right on into the book haul. First, like I said, we went to, um, I don't think it's national. I think it's more of like a local based company, Second and Charles. You could take in all of your used books, games, board games, like tabletop games, puzzles, toy. I don't know if they'll take kids toys that are used. I think they do because they have like, you take in your comics, all of that kind of stuff. Um, it's a secondhand store, they'll buy everything from you, obviously give you cash or they'll give you significantly more store credit, which is what we always do, and then we turn right around and spend it back at the store anyway, so I'm just constantly recycling the credit, which is awesome. But we went there and now that my son's in school, my husband and I try to go on Friday dates, and so we've been going there, we went there the last two. Um, just to look around. He usually gets D&D &D comic related stuff and I solely get books or find stuff to buy for my son. Just like in this case. I went ahead and bought this for $2.50 at Second and Charles and it is the Painless Grammar. Support state standards. Learn how to transform grammar problems into fun the painless way. Um, fourth edition, I don't know exactly when it came out. I know I could rifle through here, but I'm not going to do that right now. But I had picked this up for him because, like I said, um, we will be moving and traveling and doing either umbrella school under Colorado terms, unschooling, a mixture of that, and homeschooling while we travel. So I'm starting to look for things to pick things up at least through sixth and seventh grade for my son. So I got this. Um, I feel like this is great for elementary school, but the reason I got this is just as a backup to go through everything in case he's confused, in case we need to like re-explain something. It covers so many great topics in here, and honestly, I wanted like a reference guide for things that I'm not the best at explaining for him. So it's like chapter one is parts of speech, your nouns, your pronouns, your verbs, your adjectives, your conjunctions, your prepositions, and your interjections. Sentence two is like building and punctuating sentences. So sentences, fragments, phrases, clauses, 
punctuation, abbreviation, symbols, numbers, and emphasis. Chapter three is called agreement, and it's agreement between subject and verb. Agreement between pronoun and antecedents. And then chapter four is about words that we misuse, if they're one word or two word, confusing pairs. Chapter five is about cleaning up your messy writing. Chapter six is about writing a good email, but I just think that applies in general. Chapter seven is getting it all together and editing a paper. So I think very invaluable resource for us to have while we're traveling, just to have for quick refer reference of things when we're doing like reading, writing, just comprehension is so important. <laughs> so this, now that I've spent 10 minutes talking about this, I think this was a great find for $2.50. The next thing that I found at Second and Charles was something that was actually brand new and I got it. It's originally like almost 20 bucks and I got it for 10. It is the National Parks of the USA postcards. I haven't opened it or anything yet, but the reason I got this is because, and this will come further and I'll explain better then, um, but while we are traveling, I'm going to end up putting up my Patreon again. I took it down a long time ago. Um, but I'm gonna end up putting up my Patreon again and I'm going to get my Patreon supporters or my patrons. <laughs> um, I'm going to end up getting my patrons postcards from every place that we travel to send to them and just a fun little goodie bag along with drawing my own. It's I just have a lot of hopes for my art while we're traveling and I wanna draw like stamps and postcards for the locations that we go, which I'll probably be sharing online as well. So this kind of just tipped that off for me and I actually have a basket that we're starting of stuff to take with us on our trip and two of the brand new books that I just got at Barnes & Noble 20 minutes ago, I'm gonna be putting in this basket as well because I'm not going to be reading them until we go to travel. It just feels like the right time to read those. So I'll explain those in a second, but this is the second thing I got at Second and Charles, even though it's brand new. This next section is going to be going over these three books that I just got brand new at Barnes & Noble. So, this one, this one is The Oak Papers and this one's The Late Migrations. These two I'm going to speci be specifically saving in that basket to not read until we start to travel. Um, and let me explain to you a little bit as to why I'm going to be waiting. Um, but my understanding of the Oak Papers says this is a profound meditation on the human need for connection with nature. Canton's writing has an exquisite, somewhat dreamlike quality. Um, there is no, like, it, there is no real synopsis. These are just reviews written on the back and there's nothing on the inside cover. I have never heard of this, but it's called a social science anthropology physical book. A memoir and, and an homage to an 80-year-old oak tree that meditates on the mysteries of nature. So, maybe that seems pretty obvious as to why I want to save this for when we go to travel. So, is, yep, the oak paper's gonna save it till we go to travel. It seems like a good read. I really, while we're traveling, I really do want to disconnect on top of all the fun things and the homeschooling and the traveling and just experiencing things in life, which side note, my husband and I are going to sit down and film a video answering questions about this because I am getting a lot in my real life and just sprinkled throughout online about why we're doing what we're planning to do and I'll plan to discuss it all in there. After, once this video, once that video is out, I'll try to make sure to come back and include a timestamp of it up here so you can reference it if this is later. Um, but I really do want to be taking the time to disconnect. I have been struggling emotionally for a very long time and I want no distractions. I really just want to throw myself into it and accept and suffer honestly through everything that it will have for me in its hands, I guess, if that's, that's the wrong way to explain it, but I just, maybe, maybe, I may be building it up too much in my mind, but I just want something so different that I've been so desperate for, for over a decade of my life, um, honestly, better part of 15 years of my life that I've been so desperate to do this, and it's never felt like the right time, and now I'm just going to go for it, so, Long-winded to say, I am so excited to read this. 
but I'm going to wait until we're actually on the road. The next one is called The Late Migrations, A Natural History of Love and Loss by Margaret Rinkle. Um, this, we'll read the back. <laughs> this, I'm, I'm a sucker for buying with my eyes. I love this yellow color and it visually just looks beautiful with all the imagery in here, if you can see. Very beautiful. Um, but it says, in brief essays, Rankle traces, I think it's Rankle, <laughs> traces a tender and honest portrait of her unforgettable parents and of the bittersweet moments that accompany a child's transition to caregiver. Braided into the overall narrative, she also offers observations in the world surrounding her suburban natural home. Ringing with rapture and heartache, these essays convey the dignity of bluebirds and rat snakes, monarch butterflies, and native bees. As the two threads haunt and harmonize with each other, Rankle suggests that there is an astonishing there is astonishment to be found in common things, in what seems ordinary in what we all share, for in both worlds, the natural one and our own. The shadow side of love is always lost, and the grief is only the shadow side of love is always lost, and grief is on only love's own twin. So, interestingly enough, you'll see here in a second, I seem to be leaning more towards like familial type books, um, like family dynamics, and I've never read anything in like essay format, so I'm kind of excited to read that. I am kind of a sucker for really short blurb chapters and things that I've read before, like, um, what is it called? I just finished it. Oh my gosh, I have to look it up. I just finished the book. Why can't I think of it? It was really much like this book. Hold on one second. All My Puny Sorrows. That's how All My Puny Sorrows read to me and I really enjoyed it. So I'm really excited for this, but again, this will be going in that box or in that, ba in that basket and waiting until we start to travel. The next and last one I bought brand new is called The Shining Life, a novel by Harriet Klein. Um, and I got this just now at Barnes and Noble and let's read over the synopsis together. This is me, Ollie, he's 11 years old. He hasn't yet met a killer Sudoku he can't solve, but he finds the world around him difficult. People say, say what, people don't say what they mean and he hates being wrong. And now a sudden tragedy teaches him that there is no easy answer to the problem of grief. When Ollie's happy-go-lucky father, Rich, dies of brain cancer, his mother, Ruth, has no idea how to keep living and the entire family is thrown into disarray. The only thing that makes sense to Ollie is the puzzle he's convinced his father left behind. One gift from each member of the family. If Ollie can find the connection between a pink face and an old pair of binoculars, then somehow he'll discover the secret he believes Rich wanted to share with all of them, what it means to be alive. Interweaving the characters' voices, this deeply felt novel paints a portrait of a family learning to come together through the darkest times. The shining life is a poignant yet poignant yet ultimately uplifting meditation of grief, healing, and love. So, <laughs> I just don't know how to stay away from it, and I don't know if that's always a good thing. But, yes, I'm finding myself more interested in family dynamics. Yes, family things and everyone has struggles. I'm not interested in airing any of those on here. But I'm just going through some shit. And I've continued to go through some shit. And it's been a really difficult couple of years with my dad dying, my car accident, my TBI. You guys are probably so sick of hearing this as if this is not your first video. I just have a lot of shit <laughs> that I'm working through, even past childhood trauma, just trauma on trauma and forgiving people and letting people back into my life and having people walk away that I didn't think would ever go anywhere. Um, it's just been so fucking much more difficult than I thought all of it ever could be. <laughs> we are not crying. <laughs> so, yes, I'm leaning really hard into grief and healing and just forgiveness and grace and love and just trying to figure it out. <laughs> so, I'm excited to read this one. Um, it'll go on my TBR pile. At some point, you'll probably see it in a book review monthly wrap-up. 
Next are all the books that I got on thrift books. There is one that still has not arrived. So these four from thrift books, I feel like go together. One is a field guide um, to field identification of trees in North America. This one I'm so excited about. Again, this is going to go in the basket for when we start to travel. Someone left their old bookmark in here. Um, but I think this is so fascinating because I love trees. I love trees so much and I think I've talked about this before but my job is working with plants, flowers, in nature. Um, but I'm learning so much about it and I've always had a fascination. So like this, this is like everything that I want. It just is a field guide. It's exactly what a field guide is. It helps you identify. It shows pictures. It appreciates in color. It tells you where things originated, how tall they are. It shows you where they're located at in the United States, which obviously is North America, which is relevant to me when we go to start traveling um, and just being able to get out there and identify the trees and know what they are and know how to identify them gives me so much excitement. So there is this. This will be going, like I said, in that basket for later. This one is a really old one. <laughs> which it got for $2.99 on thrift book, um, on thrift books, but it's Kate Greenaway's Language of Flowers. And it says, the Language of Flowers was published in 1884 during the apex of Green, or of Kate Greenaway's career in her design with children and flowers to epitomize the real success of her work and their delicate lines and, accuracy, and accurately reproduced colors. Kate Greenaway's work not only charmed the academic fine art world, but also cre created a fashionable popular demand and, and reminded a rapidly industrialized society that the appreciation of quiet child nativity, nature, and fancy were necessary. So this is a very old copy and I actually should and want to clean it just because it does not not to look very nice it has like the oldest if you've ever picked up a very old book and just smelled it that like super musky smell is what this smells like but this one does have pictures in it it goes through and it has explanations of flowers and some of them's meaning and just yeah so i talked in my last it was in my August wrap up about being more interested in the language of flowers. So, you know, these books were all like two to five dollars. So I took advantage. Yep, that's the language of flowers. Originally printed in 1886, which is wild. These two are basically the same thing. <laughs> this one is Floweropedia, A Thousand Flowers and Their Meanings, which this one is less exciting inside than I wanted it to be. I was expecting, I think from this one, what this one is, but then that's kind of stupid because I have this one too. This one is literally just an entire basic, the most basic form of a breakdown. However, I noticed at the beginning, this one talks about what feeling you're trying to convey first before giving you a flower for it. So like this one says, clinging love, wisteria, closer to you, slash I want to be, flannel flower, closure, artichoke, codependency, bee balm, coherency, cosmos. Like, so this is like based on feeling or emotion that you're trying to express in the front half. And then here at the very back, it says section three is resources. This one talks about, this one's cool. This one has anniversary flowers, flowers for the days, flowers of the months, Chinese flowers of the months, traditional Western, Japanese, Australian, flowers of the zodiac, uh, national flowers, flowers for each state, um, like mine's the Columbine for Colorado, Canadian, it's just interesting, different plants, Chinese rose numbers, and then it goes by the botanical names in the very back um, section. But uh, just a brief descriptor here. It says, Flowerpedia is an A to Z reference guide for over a thousand flowers researched and compiled by botanical explorer Sher Cher Sherilyn Darcy. 
This comprehensive dictionary includes each flower's corrective botanical name for easy and exact identification. You will delight in understanding what each flower means emotionally, spiritually, and symbolically, and are also able to search by the feeling or emotion you wish to convey or change, which, please, tell me more. I just think that's so fucking romantic. <laughs> Expertly written with easy to understand insight, Sherilyn shares how we can work with our myriad of flowers to achieve balance, calm, or healing in our lives, homes, and gardens. For both the enthusiastic gardener and anyone charmed by the beauty and energy of flowers, this guide to understanding and selecting the right flower for every occasion and meaning will be felt by all and will be felt and enjoyed by all. Like, hello, this is exactly what I was looking for. That will also be going in that box to go with us when we travel. This last one about flowers specifically is florog florography, floriography, floriography, <laughs> an illustrated guide to the Victorian language of flowers, which is exactly what I was talking about in my August wrap up. So it says Jessica Rue's gorgeously ir Jessica Rue's gorgeous illustrations and thoughtful research histories bring the Victorian language of flowers to life like never before. So in here, this one is, this one is so beautiful. Like I will look at this forever for the rest of my life. This one, I believe at the back, this one at the back has an index, but it's by meaning. So the first one is apologies and forgiveness and it lists all kinds, encouragement, faith, friendship, grief, and sympathy, gratitude, heartbreak, love, and romance, on and on. So again, I appreciate that it's not just alphabetical, it's by meaning, by feeling. Give that to me forever. This one is beautiful. Let me, every single page is like that. Is that not the most beautiful thing? Lady Slipper, Mint. People don't ever know what mint looks like when it flowers. Orange blossom. Orange blossom. It gives its scientific name and it says meaning eternal love. Origin. The orange blossom was one of the most popular wedding flowers during the Victorian era. From simple ceremonies to extra extravagant gal galas, <laughs> almost every wedding included the orange blossom. When Queen Victoria married Prince Albert in 1840, she wore a headdress of orange blossoms. This flower's association with eternal love can be traced to ancient Greece. When Hera married Zeus, she was given orange blossoms by Gaia, the ancient goddess of the earth and fertility, paired with dogwood for an anniversary gift after a difficult year. Ivy for, and then you pair it with Ivy for long lasting relationship. Like, please let me start a floral farm just because I think they are so beautiful. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> this next section is called me being obsessed with myself. Self-obsessed book haul. <laughs> These are very interesting to me. I am so intrigued, excited to read these, want to understand more. Just some background really quickly. My name, full name is Cassandra. Yes, my middle name is Lynn, it is with an E. I have to spell it out because everyone thinks that it's L-Y-N-N -N traditionally, but mine is not. However, I digress. My first name is Cassandra. I hated it my whole life growing up until I was in my mid twenties, probably closer to my thirties to be completely honest. Um, but, I grew up Catholic and we used to get these little cards. I'll see if I can find one and I'll throw it up here if I can find one of my name. And it was, my name means the pleaser of men basically. And then I remember hearing frequently while growing up that was if I pleased men, I could have anything my heart desired. And that is fucked up. Like it, the layers of trauma <laughs> there speak too true to regrets in my life. Not even regrets, I don't regret anything, but they speak so true. It just speaks so true to like just my trauma. Like 
my mistakes, things that I have thought had more importance than myself because it's never been about myself um, until more and more recently. And I've had a lot of shit to heal. Um, but I know the name Cassandra through the grace times and that's what this one is more. But, so let's start with this one. So this one is Cassandra, a novel and four essays by Krista Wolf. It says, <laughs> in the tradition of such masterpieces of historical fiction as Mary Renault's The King Must Die, East German writer Krista Wolf movingly retells the story of the fall of Troy, but from the point of view of the woman whose visionary powers earn her contempt and scorn, Written as a result of the author's Greek travels and studies, Cassandra speaks to us in a pressing monologue whose inner focal points are patriarchy and war. In the four accompanying pieces, which take the form of travel reports, journal entries, and a letter, Woof describes the novel's genesis. Inclusive and intelligent, the entire volume represents an urgent call to examine the past in order to ensure a future. So... I think the other thing I was really told about my name growing up was just how hated Cassandra was in Greek times and yes, the pleaser of man, but also just to be hated and never believed, never ever, ever believed. And that alone, <laughs> I remember reading this stuff while going through my divorce and all the abuse recovery and trauma healing and just everything like I hated hearing about that because then I felt like I was always destined to just this is gonna sound so damn dramatic but I feel like I was in a place of believing that all I was destined to do was to please other people because I'm such a people pleaser um not me about to cry again um but also <laughs> okay <laughs> i'm okay <laughs> but also in greek times of her just like never being believed and i had a lot of people not have my back when i was going through some stuff and even recently like just some of the family stuff i've talked about like a lot of times i'm made out to be the villain and i'm never believed and no one ever wants to hear oh my god this is getting too deep no one ever wants to hear my take on things or believe me or even have a conversation with me about stuff. So I had a hard time with that growing up. And that kind of directly relates to this one as well and why I bought these two. And I'm so excited to read these. Dang it, I need to read them October because my birthday's in October. So these are gonna be my October reads and we'll have a huge ass chat about them at the end of October. Mark my damn words. This next one, which is so funny, it comes from the King County Library System in Washington and it has the library thing on here, but I did buy it on thrift books, promise. This one call, is called Cassandra Speaks. When women are the storytellers, the human story changes, which like, yes, I just love the title of that. This one says, what if men and women had told our origin tales and hero myths are guiding stories about love and sex, power and war, and the value we live by? Imagine if the books written, the movies directed, and the art made by women had also been called the greatest, the most powerful, the creations that define what it means to be human. What if women had been storytellers too? Cassandra Speaks answers these questions and explores what happens now when women dig deep for the courage to speak from our own, from our own experiences, when we flex our confidence, and when we tell new stories that champion caretaking, venerate compassion, and elevate communication over vengeance and violence. Elizabeth Lesser, I forgot to say that's who this is by, shows us how change in the culture starts with interchange and that no one, woman or man, is immune to the corrupting, the corrupting influence of power. She offers a vision that transcends the either slash or ideologies on both sides of the gender debate and provides tools to help all people be both gentle and powerful, caring and courageous, and ready to work together to create a better world for everyone, which is like all I fucking want in life, so I'm so excited to read this. But it says, Elizabeth Lesser speaks to the value of finding your voice and taking a new kind of hero's journey. 
Um, Cassandra Speaks helps us understand the roots of women's shame and guilt and offers a path forward. By changing our stories, we change our lives, which, yes! <laughs> so, entirely selfish, and I'm not sorry. I am so excited to read these, expect these, and October's wrap up because that is my birthday month. I am a Libra through and goddamn through. Next, next I have these four, but also one more that is not here yet. So let's deep dive through these pretty quickly, hopefully. So this one's called The Unbearable Lightness of Being by Milan Kundera, I believe. A young woman in love with a man torn between his love for her and his incorrigible womanizing, one of his mistresses and her humbling faithful lover. These are two couples of whose story is told in this masterful, masterful novel. In a world in which lives are shaped by irrevocable choices and by futurist events, a world in which everything occurs but once existence seems to lose its substance, its weight. Hence we feel the unbearable lightness of being, not only as the consequence of our pristine actions, but also in the public sphere, and to inevitably intertwine. Yes, can't wait to read this. Love and both feel sad for the little doggo on the front. This and I think all four of these came marked as, I don't think this one's new. The other ones did through thrift books. So I've seen this one. Someone has gone through and dog-eared a bunch of pages in here, so definitely this one is used. Like, there's a bunch dog-eared through here. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to read this. Excited to read it. The next one, I believe this one is brand new. I actually saw this. I got this brand new through Thrift Books for much cheaper. It says $17 on here. I paid like $13.50 for it on Thrift Books. Um, but this is on Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, a novel by Ocean. I don't know. I don't want to, I'm not good with names. Um, on Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous is a letter from a son to a mother who cannot read. Written when the speaker, Little Dog, is in his late 20s, the letter unearths a family history that began before he was born, a history whose epicenter is rooted in Vietnam. At once a witness to the fraught yet undeniable love between a single mother and her son, it is also a brutally honest exploration of race, class, masculinity, and our current American movement. Immersed as we are in addiction, violence, and trauma, but undergird undergirded by compassion and tenderness, the, I keep getting a glare off my glasses onto the book. The question of how to survive and how to make it a kind of joy powers the most important debut novel of many years. So this, do I need to say more? I've heard great reviews about this. Cannot wait to read this. Was kind of shocked to see it on there and for cheaper than it is in the store, which like I said, it's $17. I got it for $13.50, I think. Um, but yeah, I don't feel like much explanation needs to be had. We'll dive into it more um, when we read it and it's in a wrap up. This one I thought was interesting. And this is another reason that I was so excited about this one because it talked about going in essay format. That's what this one is. This is the Collected Skinny Schizophrenia Essays by S. May Wong. I had heard about this one also came new, but it says it's $16, which I didn't pay that much for it. I'll have to look. I don't think I paid over $14 for any of the new books, so. But this says, the collected schizophrenia begins with, with Esme Wong's long journey toward a diagnosis and then ventures into the daily realities of life with mental illness. Wong's essays dispel misperceptions and provide insight into a condition excuse me, long misunderstood, culminating in a book of undeniable clarity and power. So again, heard absolutely massive reviews on this. Cannot wait to read this. So excited. Just I, anything psychology based as well. Anything where I can learn more just about the human experience, human emotions. I don't personally know anyone with schizophrenia, but and obviously, not that I need to, to read a book about anything. I didn't mean that to sound so snooty, but I'm excited for this. I always want to learn more, to understand more, to understand human nature as well as just real life nature. So I have a very, not niche, but a very like directed view of things 
that I find spark my interest. So that is the collected schizophrenia. Like I said, we will dive into that further once I actually read it. The next one is the 10,000 Doors of January. And the only reason, this one came new as well. The only reason I bought this one was because I had a friend, I don't know anything about it. Again, saw it at Barnes and Noble. This is $17, I didn't pay that much for it on thrift books, but I had a friend who raved about this so much. She was like, I'm gonna send you my copy and Anyway, I beat her to the punch and <laughs> I just bought it. Um, but this says, as the war of the wealthy, I didn't even read it. It's The 10,000 Doors of January by Alex Harrell. Um, it says, as the ward of the wealthy, Mr. Locke, January Scaler, Scaler, fills little difference from the artifacts that decorate his sprawling mansion. Carefully maintained, largely ignored, and utterly out of place, but when she finds a strange book, one that tells a tale of secret doors of love, adventure, and danger for the first time, January realizes she can escape her story and sneak into someone else's. Which, that just sounds exciting. Um, I know a lot of people didn't love The Midnight Library, um, but I really love, so far, um, there's another book that I read like this that has one thing kind of taking you into another thing. Uh, there's, I think there's just a lot of books that are like that. Um, but one book taking you into the story of another book just sounds really cool. It's really, really what I think I had talked about this. What I had wanted Clara and the Sun to be, I didn't realize it was about AI things, which threw me off and I hated the book, but I was really hoping that was kind of like what Clara and the Sun was going to be. I thought it was going to be about being a book and being purchased and traveling with people. Um, so excited to read this, excited to know more. It sounds really interesting. And I think I might throw myself into a challenge next year where each month I'm going to read the book that has the title and the name. So hello, January wrap up. This will be there. <laughs> And the very last one, like I said, it's not gonna be here for another week, but it's called You Fill It Just Below the Ribs by Jeffrey Craner and Janina Mathewson. I don't know anything about this book, so let's read the synopsis on Goodreads really quick. A fictional autobiography is an alternate 20th century that chronicles one woman's unusual life, including the price she pays to survive and the cost her choices hold for the society she is trying to save. Both at the end of the world, Miriam grows up during the Great Reckoning, a sprawling decadeless long, a decade-long war that nearly decimates humanity and strips her friends and family. Devastated by grief and loneliness, I don't have a theme to my life. <laughs> she emotionally exiles herself, avoiding relationships or allegiances, and throws herself into her work, disengagement, disengagement that serves her when the war finally ends and the new society arises. To ensure a lasting peace, the new society forbids anything that may cause tribal loyalties, including traditional families. Suddenly, everyone must live as Miriam has chosen to, disconnected and unattached. A researcher at heart, Miriam becomes involved in implementing this detachment process. She does not know it is the beginning of a darkly sinister program that will transform this new world in the lives of everyone in it. Eventually the harm effects of her research become too much for Miriam and she devises a secret plan to destroy the system from within, endangering her own life, but, but is her confession honest or is it a fabricated riddle with lies to conceal the truth? And we're finishing this book call in very crappy quality iPhone video because my battery just died and I didn't charge my other ones. But that was You Feel It Just Below the Ribs. Again, sounds so interesting for lack of better words because I'm so limited in my vocabulary. Hopefully you enjoyed the book haul. I'm really trying to branch out there and find things that interest me more versus just buying things based on book talk and YouTube and whatever the fuck other things. Um, but yeah, you will see those come in and out different months, hopefully, as I read them. Um, I have a few different challenges that I want to start or objectives that I want to complete with my reading and you will see those kind of fall through um, and yeah, a lot of these, like I said, are going into my um, box for traveling when we go to move. 
and you'll see those come about in a year's time when all of that actually starts to happen. But from now until then, thank you guys for watching and I will see you guys probably in the next wrap up or a gaming video or something of that nature because that's the kind of videos I do here. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching and I'll see you babes in the next one. <laughs> Bye!